but we do have scenes on a drinking cup depicting the kinds of work going on here. We see some of the tools, we see these various bits and pieces of body parts here. We see a person hammering on a, a figure with no head. Here's someone kindling uh, what appears to be a, an upright furnace. Here are two workers sort of scraping on another sculpture. Um, but, uh, you know, this cup certainly doesn't tell the whole story. The good news, though, is that foundries and their processes have changed <laughs> remarkably little over the centuries. There's a few health and safety improvements, but by and large, the fundamentals are the same. Um, the alloy compositions are slightly different now as well. And in the case of, you know, industrial casting, uh, technology has brought tremendous advances, particularly in the refractory materials that you use to heat up the metal. But um, the process of uh, casting is, is pretty much unchanged, and it's done by what is called the lost wax casting method. Now, reduced to the most basic possible terms, you make a model of something in wax, uh, like here. These are the very best diagrams I've ever found to illustrate these processes, so I hope you can follow along with me here. You um, model up something in wax, and you replace this with uh, liquid metal. So how do you do that? You model up your wax, and then you attach to the outside of it this whole network of what we call runners or sprues or gates. There's a, a lot of words for them sometimes, but fundamentally it's to allow all the gas and metal to flow freely around this casting space. You then embed all of this in some kind of refractory, which is a, a material that's more or less impervious to heat, so ceramic, usually. And then you heat this up and out comes the wax, leaving you with an empty space on the interior of that refractory. Then you pour the molten metal in, which runs down and fills up all these cavities. You break away the refractory, leaving you with the sculpture and also irritatingly all of the gates and runners that you then have to remove and clean up and chase. To me that having done bronze casting this is the most irritating part of the entire job but that is um, a basic uh, lost wax casting done in the direct method. What's important to note about this is that you do lose your mold. It's, um, it's damaged and the outcome of the process is a solid lump of metal. So that's why you can really only do it for objects up to a certain scale. This object here in the Art Institute collection is really only, as you can see, about nine inches tall. Um, for larger things, um, this is a different story. There's, I should say that there's only one person who's ever been enough of a virtuoso or a, a lunatic uh, to pull off a solid cast on a life-size or monumental scale. If some of you have traveled to Florence, you will have seen the result of that process. It's Cellini's Perseus and Medusa. It sits in front of the Palazzo Vecchio. But accounts Cellini left uh, indicate that the process was pretty harrowing. <laughs> Essentially, the metal curdled and turned clumpy, the furnace blew up, uh, the roof caught fire, and he had to sacrifice all his pewter tableware to resmelt the molten metal. And this was in the 16th century when refracting technology and metallurgy had come somewhat further along than in the 5th century BC. So Cellini's drama lays out quite clearly the perils and all the potential mishaps in casting huge objects. I mean, melting large batches of metal is not easy. The alloy may not melt evenly, and vast amounts of gases are generated in the process. These can be noxious for the people working in the foundry, but they can also be trapped within the cast, resulting in porous areas or flaws that need repairing. And the larger a cast is, the more difficult it becomes to cool it evenly throughout. And just not to mention, uh, handling vast amounts of molten metal is challenging and expensive. So to reduce the likelihood of running up against these types of problems and to deal with something much larger, 
you use what is called the indirect lost wax casting method. So remember what I said about large scale bronzes being the highest artistic and technical achievement in antiquity. I'm, I'm about to tell you why, why we say so. Here's a, a schematic of that method. Uh, this time you, you model up your object in clay and then you cut apart the pieces into smaller castable sections. Each of those is then put into a mold that can be removed. And when this is dried or uh, at a position to be removed from the mold, you open up the mold and then you line the inside of the mold with wax. Then you fill so that you don't have a solid wax core, but a cavity inside. That cavity gets filled with some other type of refractory and then uh, cast again, put back into its, it's demolded. So, and then the whole thing is assembled once again. This is for a small scale, but on a large scale, the pieces are cast separately and an important an important thing to note are these little rods sticking out. These are, these are little metal sticks that pass through the wax and into the refractory core at the center to hold the whole thing in registration. And then for, for a smaller sculpture like this one, this would all be cast in its entirety and the core would remain inside. But for the larger bronzes, like what we are talking about with Dionysus, these parts are cast separately the core is removed and then the whole thing is joined metallurgically um, with other casting processes like soldering and um, patching. This is so difficult. <laughs> I mean, even under the best of circumstances in a modern, modern foundry. I mean, there are, there are any number of opportunities throughout the process for things to go wrong. And the prospect of doing this in the ancient world really um, blows my mind and speaks to an absolutely remarkable level of sophistication. So turning our attention specifically to Dionysus, we know it was cast in eight major sections, like in this diagram here. And those cast sections are extremely thin, averaging less than two millimeters in most areas. Now, thin castings use far less bronze, but they are very technically challenging to execute. In a thin cast, the molten metal cools more quickly so it doesn't flow as easily throughout the cast. And as a result, these casts are also extremely fragile. Um, so what can happen is the cast can come out of the mold with all kinds of holes and cracks that need to be patched. And Dionysus has been patched heavily, as you see in this diagram here, more than 100 times, actually. The extent of the patching is a bit hard to see now because the sculpture underwent a great deal of restoration in the recent past, but this infrared image helps to give a sense of where they are. You'll see that there are several very large patches in the center of the back here um, where the irregular holes were filled with large pieces of metal. Uh, these large sheets of metal as well as two others on the back of the right thigh and calf all appear to date from the time of the statues production. Now between the two ancient patches up here and down here you see this large patch in a sort of triangular shape and it's got a different sort of coloration a bit more turquoise. So I'll, I'll come back to this patch in a while but I just want to flag it for your attention now. So what else can we see? Remember what I told you about chaplets from the casting diagram? If I didn't call them chaplets at the time, I should have. That is what they are. The small metal pins used to hold the model. And here we see one of them on the inside of the proper right foot. What else do we know about the Dionysus just from looking? How about, how about its color? Is this how the sculpture would have looked 2,000 years ago? Definitely not. Freshly cast bronze has a deep brownish gold appearance, like the image on the right. Um, most modern bronze sculptures are artificially colored after casting using chemicals, a process we call patination. And this is what you see um, 
with the sculpture that's been installed in its permanent location on the far right. But patination can also happen naturally. So remember that I said bronze is primarily copper, and copper on its own is a bright orange color. And I'm going back to earth science again. Copper has what we call two oxidation states. This means that when copper atoms join with atoms of other elements to make compounds, the electrons have a tendency to shuffle around in such a way that they will lose either one or two electrons from these outer shells. This means they're able to combine with other, other elements to produce a wide range of possible combinations. And out in the world, especially here in Chicago, where many of our buildings are clad in copper, you've probably seen this process, but maybe didn't think about it in quite these terms. From a chemistry point of view, this is what's happening out there on the roof. You've got copper existing in both oxidation states, reacting with the oxygen and the carbon dioxide in the air. It's reacting with atmospheric moisture, be that a thunderstorm or just a humid day. Burning fossil fuels also provides sulfur for the copper to react with as well. And this whole set of reactions is how things go in a system with a fairly constrained set of variables. Now, imagine a bronze, which we've already said is copper, tin, and lead, three different elements with different oxidation states as well. Imagine it buried in the ground for a couple thousand years where it will react with all the constituent elements of the soil, including bioorganisms. It will react with groundwater, and if it's buried under or near the sea, it will react with water of an even more complex nature. It's an almost limitless array of compounds and possible reactions. The seminal book on the subject written by David Scott at the Getty devotes entire chapters to all the major classes of these types of compounds. So each object is unique and each of their burial environments was unique as well. The results, as you can see, are spectacular. I might even say magic. Um, and while I have this slide on the screen, I just want to have a closer look at a couple of these faces. So, it's often the case that we find bronzes embellished with other materials to make them more vivid and lifelike. Eyes can be inlaid with things like shell or stone or glass paste. The surface of the Terme Boxer on the far left, for example, has inlaid copper around his wounds and bruises to make them look raw and bleeding. And Dionysus. Our investigations have confirmed that it too had been enhanced while we haven't been able to paint a clear picture of how the eyes were treated, they are clearly set back to receive an inlay. Tin, a silver toned metal was detected on the ornament of the mitra, which is that decorative headband. Tinning is highly unusual, I might add. We know of no other instance where it's been employed in this way. And the nipples were inlaid with pure copper. So what about the joints? the place where all the separately cast sections come together, as I mentioned. We've already seen that small rectangular strips of metal were used as mechanical joins around the patches, and they're also used to stabilize flaws and long cracks emanating out from the larger patches, as you see in this image here. Uh, these types of patches can also be used around the primary joins, and this is what we do see on the Dionysus at the far left. Even though it's a bit of a dinky image, it is exactly what the metalsmiths were doing uh, in laying uh, fine pieces of metal mechanically uh, to create these joins. But another common technique is to adhere the join from the interior using a ring of molten lead. So to see if there's any lead supplementing the patches, we need to have a look inside, which we do usually with an x-ray. In an x-ray, very dense materials like lead show up as white, so here. Um, medium density materials show up as gray, so these sorts of things. And voids or air pockets will be black. From looking at the films, we definitely see lots of lead, but also a whole apparatus of other things. Unfortunately, these thick smears of lead obscure quite a bit of the inner surface. 
So is there anything more potent that we can use for a better look? In fact, there is. Gamma radiation is, of course, what's responsible for turning the otherwise mild manner Dr. Bruce Banner into the Incredible Hulk, but it's also an extremely powerful type of radiation. And the key difference between X-rays and gamma rays is how they are produced. Basically, in an X-ray, all the action happens here in the electron cloud of an atom, and in a gamma ray, it happens here in the nucleus. We don't happen to have a gamma radiation source on the shelf of the Art Institute, so we work together with an industrial X-ray team from Wisconsin. Usually the NDT team is out inspecting welds on pipelines, not in an art museum, but uh, they came to help us out with this project. Now, how do you bring a radioactive isotype into the building? Why, in a yellow lunchbox about a in a yellow box about the size of a child's lunchbox, um, if that lunchbox is made of 40 pounds of depleted uranium, that is. Um, so uh, ancient bronzes do make NDT a little nervous, but gamma rays make our health and safety officer and our legal team a little nervous. So after an initial test to ensure that we had no radiation ex extending beyond the confines of our lead-lined X-ray room down in the basement, the team arrived at the museum late in the evening when the building was clear of staff to do the exams. And from these films, uh, we did learn a few other things. We can see, we picked up um, these types of um, phenomena, which we can ascribe to wax joins at the time of the initial um, fabrication. We also found that the lips are inlaid with something of a material uh, of a slightly different density. But unfortunately, the gamma radiation still wasn't sufficient to clarify what was happening on the interior. We really wanted to have a better understanding of the internal support structure, and we wanted to know if any amount of the lead was ancient. So what next? Yeah. The next step was to physically go inside the sculpture. And I want to pause for a moment to acknowledge the two people who have contributed the most to our current understanding of the sculpture. That's John Twilley and Jerry Padani. This is the first photograph I have of them, uh, but they were both involved in the project long before this moment. Jerry in particular has been aware of the sculpture and had the opportunity to examine it at the home of its previous owner. Here they are now using an industrial video scope an instrument with a tiny camera embedded into the end of a long cable. They're running it up an opening in the bottom of the proper right foot. Now, as a bit of background in conservation, one of our guiding principles is to obtain the most information with the least intervention possible. And if we must intervene, we work to ensure that our actions do not permanently alter the work. So we begin with non-destructive means of examination and then move on to invasive techniques only as necessary. So taking a sample is of course an irreversible act, but on the face of the information we gain, the loss of a microscopic amount of material is usually justified. Um, and given how much we're capable of doing with the samples, most of the time, um, you know, these, these samples are invisible to the naked eye, so we um, consider that an acceptable sacrifice. So for example, this, is, this sample was taken from the hexagonal base. It is seen here at 180 times magnification and we're able to see very clearly the alloy mixture. The pale globules are uh, lead and the gray background is the copper. Zooming in further to 532 times magnification, we're able to see the surface of the bronze on this outer edge. And we see that it is entirely different in character from the main body of the bronze below with a well differentiated uh, zone of mineralized corrosion. In this layer, we see cracks and fissures, which tell us that the corrosion layer is very brittle. With still more analysis, we're able to determine the exact composition 
of the corrosion layer, and we see that it is indeed complex, made up of a wide array of compounds. We can use a different technique to determine the ratios of copper, tin, and lead, and lead in the alloy. And we can see in this case that we are dealing with a very heavily leaded bronze. But let's get back to the lead and the internal structure. How are we going to find out any more about it if we can't have a closer look? So I should say, uh, while I'm complaining about the lead on the interior, we did find bits of lead on the exterior, such as here on the underside of the proper right foot. And we were able to take samples of that. And it did appear to be lead remaining from antiquity. Samples like these were also analyzed and found to have an overwhelming percentage of tin. This composition holds out an extremely interesting possibility for the construction of the sculpture in antiquity. The melting point of tin is extremely low, far lower than lead, and once molten, the tin stays pliable for an extremely long time and can be worked with soft tools, even with a damp piece of wood. So the lower the melting point, uh, the lower melting point reduces the difficulty of placing molten metal inside a large and cumbersome sculpture since heat that's enough to melt the solder could more easily be applied to the exterior of the bronze. But in the main, we really needed to physically examine the interior of the sculpture. And the examination through that right foot was of limited use because the rest of the leg was blocked up by plaster. So remember that patch I told you I'd come back to later? Unlike the rest of the large patches, this one was not surrounded by the smaller rectangular patches seen elsewhere. And the startling di startlingly different patina was also an indicator that it constituted a separate phase of repair. So we decided to remove it from the sculpture in order to examine the interior of the body using the videoscope. And the task fell to me to take it off. So here is the patch after I removed all the previous restoration materials in preparation for reversing the previous adhesive with heat. And on the right is Jerry having a preliminary look after removal. The patch is really interesting and appears to have been crafted from a fragment of an ancient Persian vessel with an antelope incised on the inside surface. This type of short, heavy set antelope with a lyre lyre-shaped horns is common in East Africa today, but it has been illustrated in many ancient Near Eastern and Middle Eastern contexts and may help corroborate the Near Eastern attribution of Dionysus. The patch was cut to fit the shape of the loss and hammered to the proper curvature. In the process of reshaping, we see that uh, the layer of green corrosion, too brittle to withstand the new curvature, cleaved away at in the areas where the metal was beaten here and here. The thickness of the patch approximately 1.2 millimeters exactly matches that of the sculpture. A compass was used to scribe these circles around the animal and a variety of other tool marks um, attest to the use of punches and gravers. So once inside the sculpture, a wide array of information came to light. It was possible to see tool marks uh, preserved in the bronze on the inner surface of the wax, casting or flash lines um, where molten metal fills, fills the voids in the clay core could also be seen. Many more chaplets were visible. And while it was possible to see that the majority of the lead on the interior was modern rolled sheet lead held in place by an adhesive, a large lead spill in the uh, proper right armpit seemed to have the potential to be ancient. The appearance, the appearance of this area was different from the rest, poured in a series of layers while molten rather than rolled sheet. An analysis showed that it consists of the oxides of lead and tin, and by implication that it is not lead metal alone, but rather a low melting solder alloy of lead and tin, just like the smaller sheltered samples I discussed earlier. When the analysis was finished, we decided to retain the patch separately rather than reintegrate it back into the sculpture. 
But before doing so, we took a sample from the patch for comparison. And if you recall back to the previous slide with large pools of lead floating in a matrix of copper, here we see almost precisely the opposite, a relatively homogeneous metal with striations formed in response to working. ICPMS analysis confirms that the composition is almost entirely copper with less than 2% of lead. So the casting oil alloy and the patch bear no relation to one another at all. And yet we found several interesting things. For starters, the patch also has a textile pseudomorph. It's not as coarse as the one on Dionysus, but it's definitely a weave pattern that you can see on magnification. This means that it too was wrapped in a fabric of some kind and buried. But most interestingly of all, when we compared the corrosion products on both the patch and Dionysus, we found them to be of the same composition. The presence of copper silicates, which are relatively unusual as corrosion products go, points to a very specific burial environment and leads us to believe that the objects were found in the same archaeological context or at least very near each other and that the vessel recovered from the site was subsequently used to make the large patch as well as many of the smaller rectangular patches. As far as what to use to replace the patch, I thought there was something quite elegant about casting the patch in resin. Unlike other material options, doing this would allow me to tailor the base color to the best match for the underlying bronze. And it would also let me copy the texture of the surrounding corrosion layers. It's a lot harder to disguise something that's smooth and flat when it's surrounded uh, by a bumpy surface. Now, like casting bronze, casting resin in thin sheets is very difficult. It's almost impossible not to get air trapped somewhere in the cast. I'm using here a two-part silicon rubber for my mold, and you see that I also use a system of gates and sprues to facilitate the movement of air and resin through the mold. And here's the patch after finishing. I was quite pleased with the texture and the color, and you'll see that the rubber also picked up the hammer marks as well as the corrosion patterns. I also, just for honesty's sake, like that the impression of the deer will also be on the inside. Uh, no one will ever know but me and now you, but the fidelity to the original feels really good. And here is the integration process after I uh, attached the cast to the sculpture. You see around the perimeter I did some fine filling with a tinted acrylic putty and then I uh, retouched um, the whole patch and fills to match. I thought it was quite a good result and I also like the fact that we got rid of that distracting sort of turquoise tonality. The patch appears, if you come to the museum, the patch is on display next to the Dionysus. So one of the most important aspects of the study was the chance to assess the nature and stability of the internal support structure. And I've put up a composite of images that John and Jerry took of the interior using the video scope. They're in no particular order. And if all this appears like a hodgepodge mess of all sorts of things, is it because, it's because it kind of is. Um, and I can't minimize the amount of work this is. I, I have tried using the video scope and I can't stand it. Um, so I just, I really want you to understand what a colossal effort and tremendous feat it is that John and Jerry were able to produce this. This uh, is a schematic that they put together that shows us exactly what we are dealing with inside the sculpture. Um, we see this complex network of lead straps and cuffs, aluminum flat stock, threaded rod, plaster wires, and I'm all, all manner of mechanical fasteners. They also found this slip of paper inside. We, we feel pretty sure it's probably the signature of the person who put the Dionysus back together in what looks to be July 26, 1963. And as you'll have seen in my previous slide, many of the interior components are quite rusty. And so as a result, to ensure the long-term stability of the interior, we have put a very aggressive environmental plan in place. Our goal is to keep the relative humidity inside the showcase below 30% year round. And this actually sounds more simple than it really is. This is an enormous volume of air um, and it is a tremendous challenge to maintain it at such a low relative humidity throughout all the seasons. Um, so by now you're probably thinking, does any of this 
really matter? <laughs> I mean, uh, all this laser-like focus on one inanimate object, and you know, is it really that important to know all these microscopic details about one thing? I mean, is there any way to step back and see this in a wider context? And the answer is absolutely. I mean, for one thing, you know, knowledge, knowledge is like an ocean made up of millions and millions of drops of water, you know, a bent, corroded chaplet here, a cross section of a particle of sand there, a tiny scraping of lead that you can't see without the aid of a videoscope. All of these things are the bits of knowledge that fill up this great, uh, this great corpus that we are amassing about bronze statuary in the ancient world. And something really important, um, this work represents a gradual shift in the way uh, art is being studied. More and more all the time, it's becoming an acknowledged fact that you cannot understand a work of art without a complete understanding of it from a material point of view. A whole new discipline called technical art history is beginning to supplement or round out uh, the traditional voices in art history, those of the, the curator, the connoisseur, the academic. Um, I just briefly, um, this, this exhibition cover uh, is from a catalog. Um, I should say this, this is the cover of an exhibition catalog, um, or it was an exhibition organi organized in 1996 by Harvard University Art Museum. And it consisted of more than 50 large-scale Greek, Greek and Roman bronzes, uh, including, including this Dionysus that I'm speaking about. Uh, the exhibition focused on the role of technology in ancient sculpture, using the evidence of the statues themselves to reveal the techniques by which they were made. So 25 years later, how are these kinds of technical art history approaches playing out in practice? Uh, because monumental bronzes are so rare, there's been an almost reflexive assumption that they are singular, one-off masterpieces. And this has certainly been the connoisseur's viewpoint for a long time. The Riachi bronzes, for example, have been presented as entirely different objects. And in many ways, they are. After all, they have two different uh, heads and faces, and their musculature is slightly different. But to say that they are entirely separate works of art bespeaks a lack of awareness of the indirect lost wax method. Careful study is increasingly telling us that sculptures like these were often made from the same molds and that prior to casting the wax, um, the models were refined or altered slightly. But if you look at these two sculptures, they are foundationally the same. If you know how they were made, especially if you know that molds were available to be used again and again, the differences between these two sculptures don't actually paint a picture of individual artists laboring alone in greatness, producing one-off masterpieces. They actually paint a picture of a well-developed industry making every effort to work economically in order to supply a huge demand. And don't forget, sculpture was everywhere in the ancient world in the public sphere, in the private sphere. In reality, we're better served with a mental picture of antiquity more like the image on the right than on the left. Which brings me to one of the things I like best about working with ancient materials. You know, the distance of time and the remoteness of the culture can sometimes put the classical world on a pedestal. We tend to wax lyrical about abstract ideas and philosophy, but the more time I spend with the objects themselves, the more they show me that across time and place, People have always just been people, trying to go about their business, you know, with their joys and their dramas and their petty disputes, trying to manage a family, trying to run a business, having clients who are a pain. So in that vein, one of my favorite riddles about the Dionysus is this. If you have a look at that right foot, you can see that the heel is raised and flattened on the bottom like the weight-bearing foot on the left is. There's no flex in the toes, and the sole was cast open, which is the usual practice for when the feet were intended to be flat on the ground. And when you look at the sculpture from the side, you see that the proportion of that right lower leg where it's bent at the knee is just a little too long. If you straightened the lower leg, it wouldn't fit in the space between the knee and the base. Now, we know that the foot was part of the original fabrication. There's the diagram in the middle. It's not a replacement. But recalling the parts that comprise the sculpture, 
and knowing that the molds can be used again and again, it does raise the possibility that there wasn't a suitable mold with a standard raised foot in stock at the time of the commission. And for the sake of expediency, this lower leg and foot mold was used instead, knowing that the object was likely bound for a niche where it would only be seen from the front and not the sides or the back. Now this isn't shoddy work. This is practical. It's the sort of practicality you employ when you're in charge of a busy foundry offering a range of services and varying price points. So that is what I hope in this um, 45 minutes I've been able to share. I hope this has been of interest and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Rachel. That was just amazing. And um, if anyone would like um, some questions, here you go. Just put that into the chat. Um, was this an institute purchase or a donation by the previous owners? It is a loan. It's a loan to us. Uh, we have um, a very generous benefactor who supplements our ancient collection with some truly stupendous objects. So we're very indebted to him. Um, so it's on long-term loan to us, but it's in a private collection here in Chicago. Great, great. Um, and when you say long-term, is that like a hundred years or is it? I think the, original, the original term was meant to be five, but it's still with us. So I think oh. <laughs> we'll get some more time out of it. Nice, nice. Um, good. Do we have some other questions? Give it a minute here. I have to say it was a very thorough and concise lecture and um, so fun to see that periodic table again. <laughs> and then it was really great when you had all the um, chemical um, equations there, I was like trying to remember how to read those. So um, I truly appreciate that little trip back to science. Um, <laughs> it's been a few decades. Great, great. Well, um, Thank you all. Thank you all for participating. And most of all, thank you, Rachel. This has just been, oh my gosh, such a such a special day and, and lecture and a trip back to antiquity, antiquity which oh, spit out there, um, that uh, we normally don't uh, get to take too often. So um, your, your enthusiasm and your expertise is just beyond the pale. I can't imagine what it must be like to stare at something and then know that you're the one chosen to to work with it. And um, it's an must be an incredible yes. <laughs> I responsibility. Do some questions here in the chat, if you'd like oh. me. I know we're on yeah. minutes of time. Um, I will, someone has asked if the owner will, it, will receive the remove patch back. Absolutely. Um, uh, Someone would like a snapshot of the copper tree. I'll tell you what. If you, I will put my, um, I will put my email in the chat, and I can send you the tree. It's probably easier than my horrendous navigation of the share feature. Um, Tony, who's from Harvard, actually, who knows this sculpture quite well, if I'm not mistaken, Tony. Um, did we consider full assembly and remounting of the pieces? Um, we were very reluctant to do that. Um, if it had been in the permanent collection, it's possible we would have um, maybe thought of it, but it is one of those, um, it's one of those moments where you, you think um, very, very much better is the enemy of good, if you know what I mean. Um, there, the, Object, as, as you know, Tony is uh, very, very, very fragile. And I think, um, yeah, we, what we've explored together with Jerry is um, more transit related and um, trying to find ways to reinforce that internal support. Because as you, I mean, you can imagine trying to keep something below 30% RH for years at a time uh maybe it's good for the for the internal you know the rusty bits on the interior but uh it's not good for other things um in particular it sits on a wooden base 
So it is something that um, were we to do that, it would have to be such a such a massive project, probably with with funding and collaborative work from other institutions. And I'm just not sure we'll ever get there. But I, I also don't think it's something that the lender would um, would feel okay about unless it, unless we could put together, you know, some grant funded <laughs> collaborative that includes you. Um, so I hope that answers your question. <laughs> um, and then what else? Uh, they wanted to know if there are other examples of similar models of casts used in other sculptures. Um, well, this is the this is the thing is that um, I think the Riachi bronzes are one of the only ones that show us, um, you know, in as much as the sculptures themselves don't uh, survive, the detritus, as it were, of the foundries uh, don't survive much either. There are examples of casts uh, and some some degree of molds that survive, but they're on a much smaller scale. And again, because the sculptures themselves don't survive, it's very difficult to make comparisons across sculptures to see which ones might have come from the same molds. We're, we're able to see that much more in contemporary sculpture. Um, you know, Matisse's, for example, are, are, some, are, are very well studied in terms of their, their, the molds and casts from which they're, they're issued. But in the ancient world, we lack so much of that primary evidence. Um, so it really is the existing, the few existing sculptures that um, survive that we have to sort of piece together this knowledge from. Um, and Tony, how much did we? How much time did we spend? Um, I think John and Jerry. This would have been about a year of repeated visits. Um, definitely, definitely two years from start to finish. Mm -hmm. um, it's and starts with you know, the gamma radiation and then um, John's analysis and then Jerry's report and my doing the patch. So I would say two years total, but one, one year of intensive work. So, and I think that looks like all for the questions. Yeah. That looks like yeah. Great. So, thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you. And thank you, Rachel, so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. All right. Okay. Yes.